Okay, our next presenter is Paul Lakend from uh, Viasite. Paul? Okay, thank you, and I'd like to thank the presenters for giving me an opportunity to tell you about Viasite, a company formerly known to some of you as Novacell. Viasite is a leading company in the emerging field of regenerative medicine. It's a privately held venture-backed company. Our principal site of operations are here in San Diego as well as in a small satellite facility in Athens, Georgia. We have about 53 full-time employees at the company, and we are really focused on a single, what we believe will be disruptive product for diabetes. This product combines a, a pancreatic beta cell precursor that was derived from a human embryonic stem cell line. In, we encapsulate that in an immunoprotective device, and we believe that this together has the potential to transform the, patient, the way patients with diabetes are treated. We believe it represents a potential, essentially a cure for type 1 diabetes, an important therapy for insulin-dependent type 2 patients. The company has been working at this for quite some time now, and we are now approaching clinical testing. I recently had a pre-IND meeting with the FDA, and uh, we have been generously supported by CIRM and by JDRF. So these are the core elements of our product. Uh, it starts with a renewable cell source. It's a human embryonic stem cell line, as I said, designated as Site 49. Uh, we then take that and differentiate it through a multi-step process to a pancreatic progenitor with beta cell potential. Essentially, this is a prodrug concept because we then implant this into the patient in a uh, durable immunoprotective device. We have a proprietary device we call the Encaptor Drug Delivery System. And once this is implanted in the patient, then over a several months period, the cells continue to differentiate and mature and form insulin-producing and other factor-producing cells. So a lot of work has gone on over the last few years in really getting this into a very reproducible, a regulatory compliant format that we can scale up for clinical trials and eventually commercialization. So we have these, uh, the, the cell line, the human embryonic stem cell line that we started it with is ethically derived under GMP compliant conditions. Uh, we've banked this. We have several banks in several locations um, that uh, gives us essentially an unlimited renewable source of these cells. Um, they have been extensively tested for advantageous agents. Uh, they've been, they show karyotypic and phenotypic stability. Uh, we use xenofree culture. And importantly, we can rapidly expand these from 10 million to billions of cells in, uh, in only a couple weeks. The next big part of this is the differ differentiation protocol, which most of you in here are pretty familiar with, uh, the whole concept of this. But it's been worked out to be entirely reproducible. Uh, this has been done to be regulatory compliant with uh, uh, steps along the way as we do this. It's a four-stage or four-step differentiation pro process that takes about two weeks. Uh, once what the end stage of this is get to these pancreatic precursor cells. Uh, as you can see over here, if I can figure out how to work this. When we take these and we implant them into the animal, uh, this is without, the it, without or with or without the device, they then mature over a f several month period to make these insulin, somatostatin, glucagon producing cells. What's shown here is a, a typical human islet after development in an animal for about, or, or development for about 360 days. And here's where we put our, our product, which we label PEC-01, into an animal for 377 days. And you can see very comparable in terms of the production of these various hormones. The next important part of this is to manufacture this to the level that we need for uh, clinical trials and eventually commercialization. Our initial manufacturing is really scaled for that, those clinical trials. And again, it involves expanding these human embryonic stem cells, differentiating them over that two-week period. We're then able to freeze the product, PEC-01, uh, and therefore be able to do all the stability and various other assays on it, and then when it's ready to go to the clinic, we thaw an aliquot of the cells, 
and then we load them into a device, and then that is shipped to the clinic. So what the clinic gets is the device loaded with the PEC-01, these pancreatic precursor cells. The device itself that uh, we use to encapsulate these cells uh, to increase safety and eliminate the biodistribution is a biocompatible, biostable device. It's a proprietary device that we developed. It facilitates vascularization, uh, importantly excludes the host cells and retains the grafted cells. Uh, it freely allows the uh, diffusion of oxygen, nutrients, proteins, uh, including, of course, insulin, which are freely transported against, across the membrane. Uh, it protects these allogeneic cells from the host alloimmunity, and we believe it should also protect against the autoimmunity that's seen in type 1 diabetes, and this is based on other cells that have been used in similar devices. Importantly, this device, we, as you'll see in the next slide, we put in subcutaneously, and it's removable. And that has some uh, really interesting safety as well as efficacy implications. So now we have the, the cells manufactured, we have the device. Uh, this is showing here uh, some, what the device looks like. It's a kind of a cartoon of it, but uh, this would be uh, a little bit different when we get to the commercial or the human device. But it basically has a, a fairly thin lumen that's loaded with cells it, that facilitates oxygen diffusion and all of the uh, factors coming in and out that are necessary for the regulation of these essentially beta cells. The device is implanted subcutaneously because once it's implanted, it takes two to three months to produce, uh, to mature and start producing the insulin we have to implant it in somewhere where there won't be a needle stick because, of course, these patients initially, when we first implant this device, will still be using insulin, these type 1 diabetic patients, and so they will still be injecting, so we want to keep away from the possibility of a needle stick into the device, um, but there is a lot of real estate that we can use for doing this. This shows uh, from a mouse now where we do these studies in a, a skid beige mouse model. Um, this is a device that has been implanted with the PEC-01 cells and has gone for 18 weeks in the mouse and then is removed. And this is characteristic of what we see. We've done uh, literally thousands of animals now uh, with this product. And what we see is we see a small, a, a thin encapsulation uh, of the device, as you can see along here. Uh, but we see tremendous vascularization. And the mesh that you're seeing here on the device is, is a mesh that is put over the uh, uh, diffusible membrane. Uh, the mesh provides uh, protection and structural integrity to the device. But what you can see is these vessels, as they grow in over that 18-week period, are, are completely covering the device and in, going in and out of this mesh and supplying the oxygen and glucose and other factors that are necessary for the growth of the cells. Because what the other thing that characteristic that we see is that even though we have this tremendous vascularization, uh, we see it have only a few feeder vessels, which makes, again, uh, this something that can be easily removed with very little trauma to the patient. So this shows a device now um, that's been implanted 16 weeks in a skid-based mice, mouse and then taken out and then we, we uh, section it and we look at the, what we find in it. And again, you can see this tremendous vascularization. These are all blood vessels along the walls of this. These, by the way, are artifacts from this mesh that is protective of the device over the top of the device. This is where the mesh goes in. This is the actual membrane. These are the cells that we've put in them that have now matured into insulin producing uh, essentially human islets. And so we have this tremendous vascularization and then if you visualize this uh, looking at staining for insulin, uh, glucagon and somatostatin, you can see a, a very robust production of uh, the various, uh, of insulin and other factors. And this also shows it down here, we look at C peptide. Now we're measuring human C peptide production in this mouse model. And this is after a glucose challenge. Uh, after 30 and 60 minutes, you can see that the C peptide comes up very rapidly <clears throat> and then begins de decreasing as the glucose is normalized, just, <clears throat> just as you expect. 
This now is just a representative study. Again, as I said, we've done literally thousands of, of animals with this device uh, drug combination. This is one representative study. Um, it's looking out at a group of animals, uh, again, a mouse study where the device is implanted and allowed to mature. And then seven months after this device is implanted, the animals are given STZ to essentially destroy their um, uh, endogenous beta cells, the mouse beta cells, uh, but leaves intact the beta cells that are in our device. And what you can see here is that uh, out at, all the way out here, when we get to the STZ, we have very well controlled, very similar. The, the red is actually a uh, fat pad insertion of cells, so it's outside of a device. Uh, but the rest we have in the device. And when we uh, continue this out, we see a, a good maintenance of, bl of blood glucose. And then after 70 days, we remove the devices. And what you see is immediately the animals, uh, once the device is removed, become hyperglycemic. So a, a very nice demonstration of the ability of this. Interestingly, the other thing we see consistently in these, these mouse models, the typical uh, level of glucose in a mouse is about 130 to 200, which for a human would be uh, considered uh, hyperglycemic. Generally in the mouse model, we see that once we put the device in with the human cells, they, they move down near the human set point of about 100 to 110 uh, milligrams per deciliter. Another important aspect of this approach is that we have never seen any evidence for any potential for hypoglycemic. In fact, in these mouse models, the, when we put this device in, it's a very small device designed for the mouse, but if you put that same size device in a human, it would be like putting a um, cafeteria tray on your back. So these mice are, are very much overdosed with, even with this small device drug uh, cell combination about 10 to 30-fold overdose. And here what we're showing is, again, in this mouse model now, we do a glucose challenge. So we take these mice, we give them a, a large bolus of glucose, and as expected, the blood glucose rises. But fairly rapidly, the uh, insulin is released, and we now see a reduction, a reduction at glucose back to normal levels. But even though this is 30, uh, 30, 10 to 30-fold overdose, we see no hypoglycemic overshoot. So we think this is a big advantage for this approach. So as I mentioned at the beginning, we are uh, on the path to the clinic. Uh, we're, uh, we've been doing, working very hard to get this into a scalable format uh, and into a regulatory compliant format. Uh, we recently, about uh, in the last couple months, had a pre-IND meeting with the FDA that went very successfully. Um, the, uh, at that meeting, we laid out the IND enabling studies that would be required as well as the initial protocol. And so we're on track uh, initiating those IND enabling studies right now. We expect to follow the IND around the end of 2013 or early 2014 and initiate clinical trials directly after that. The initial trial design is going to be a phase one, two study. We're going to go directly into patients with type one diabetes. Uh, and we will be looking for safety, but also for an early proof of uh, activity and mechanism. Uh, even in the first patient cohort, uh, the way we are going to do this, we will have some sentinel devices in there that we can pull out at different times. And we can look and see if the cells are differentiating as we expect without the need for any immune suppression as we expect. Uh, so even in the very first cohort, we should start seeing evidence for uh, proof of mechanism. And by the third cohort, we're expecting, we're planning to uh, provide enough of the uh, product to uh, essentially uh, render the patients independent of insulin. Um, CIRM and JDRF, especially CIRM, have been early and enthusiastic supporters of our e efforts. We've received from CIRM around $26 million to date, and we just did a, uh, we just uh, last week were the beneficiaries of an additional grant from CIRM for $10 million. Um, and uh, I, I loved when we read the uh, reviewers, that, that the reviewers' comments that they CIRM posted to their website 
the reviewers called VCO1 our combination product, the holy grail of diabetes treatments. So that figures prominently in all my presentations now. Um, so uh, on the IP part of this, uh, the company has been around for about 10 years, so this has been kind of an endogenous, if you will, project. Uh, so a lot of the IP has come from internal develop development and discovery, uh, and we have patents uh, and IP protection all along the way. Final slide to summarize, our product has the potential to address, address what we believe is a major pa unmet need in patients. Uh, by providing islets from pancreatic precursors, which are self-regulatory, regulating very much like the human pancreas, we believe we'll get superior glycemic control, uh, no needle sticks, no glucose monitoring, and no risk of hyperglycemia. Uh, it's a subcutaneous implant. It's simple outpatient procedure, uh, low risk of complications. It can be easily removed and replaced if needed. Uh, one of the concerns on this type of approach is with teratoma formation. If there is one, it will be contained in the device. We have never seen that in several thousand, several thousand animal models. Um, and we expect it will lead to a higher quality of life with uh, uh, no limitations on physical activity. And obviously, the market potential for this is very high. To, we hope to reduce the medical and uh, indirect costs of type 1 diabetes, which is about 15 billion per year in the U.S. alone. Uh, and mainly I've been focusing on type 1 diabetics, but obviously we believe this also would have a role in the insulin uh, requiring type 2 diabetics. That all, end. Thank you.